And just a quick summary of what we found. We found that Australia has more blue carbon than anywhere else in the world. Uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, we have a lot of the blue carbon ecosystems in terms of the habitats themselves. About nine to 32% of all the blue carbon habitats are in Australia. Uh, we have about five to 11% of the world's blue carbon stocks. Uh, and about two to 7% of all the carbon that's sequestered in the world is happening uh, from blue carbon ecosystems in Australia. Uh, but we are still losing these ecosystems at about one to 2% per year in Australia. Um, and if, if that loss of these blue carbon ecosystems is causing that carbon to be released, as has been shown in many studies, it's about equivalent to an extra 10 million cars on the road. So uh, we really need to protect and preserve our existing blue carbon ecosystems. So moving on with the next phase of our research, um, we know we've got lots of blue carbon. Uh, we know that we're losing lots of blue carbon. Um, but how do we alter our course, our business as usual uh, attitude? Uh, and now this is where things for me at least get really exciting uh, because carbon is a commodity like any other. Uh, internationally, we're starting to see carbon markets go gangbusters. Uh, Pre-COVID, there was almost a big corporate every week making some sort of pledge to uh, go carbon neutral. There was BP, Amazon, uh, who else do we had? We had, um, uh, anyway, there was lots of big companies uh, out there. Um, and by the way, this video is just a stocking filler, just showing some of our research in action. Um, but you know, when you've got this carbon market, it, it's, it's traded as a commodity, uh, you can treat um, it a bit like a currency and you can trade uh, activities that either increase the amount of carbon being sequestered or avoid emissions through um, loss of these ecosystems. So that's, that's a principle we call additionality. Um, some of our preliminary modeling in Australia, uh, you know, the scale of opportunity for additionality in Australia, uh, we estimate that we could double the amount of blue carbon we're sequestering in Australia each year if we really did decide to restore these ecosystems at wartime speed and scale. And that estimate, by the way, does not talk about seaweed opportunities. And I know you've already got some tough questions for Brian on that. Uh, seaweed opportunity, they are hard questions to answer when it comes to seaweed. Um, and uh, I'm sure Brian will probably explain that uh, why. Um, globally, just to put things into perspective, globally, um, if we also restored at wartime speed and scale around the world, uh, blue carbon could offset about 3% of global emissions. So uh, a lot of that would come from uh, restoration and some from protection. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk about, um, to, to probably give a bit of reality check, because I think I've probably given a very positive view of the blue carbon situation in Australia, but uh, we do have a bit of a challenge at the moment in that there's a lot of appetite for blue carbon. Uh, there are many corporates that have sort of um, integrated blue carbon into their abatement portfolio, but we do have a supply problem. We don't have a lot of shovel ready projects. Um, and I don't mean a supply problem in the sense that there's not a lot of places we could do blue carbon restoration. But what I mean is uh, there haven't been many companies that have wanted to pay for the R&D to do the heavy lifting that's needed to get our projects uh, ready to fire up the bulldozers and get the restoration happening, get the planting happening. We haven't seen a lot of that. So there's a lot of pre-restoration homework that needs to be done. And we are really looking for uh, bold and brave companies and groups, community groups to help us with some of that um, heavy lifting to deal with that supply challenge. Um, so I wanna talk a bit more about some of the on, on the ground actions. And this is a project that I think is relevant for me to talk to many of you who, as I understand are from Bayside Councils, Varesh tells me. So you, you Port Phillip Bay might be your home. This might be the place where you wanna spend a lot of your time. Uh, we've been doing uh, a, a bit of restoration around the Port Phillip Bay area. Uh, through this program. It's called the Victorian Coastal Wetland Restoration Program. Uh, I encourage you to check out um, our website there. I'll send a link just when I, I finish talking. Um, this is an amazing site actually, because um, you know, we, managed to, we've, we've, we managed to get funding from DELP, uh, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning for this program out of their biodiversity fund. Um, and one of the reasons why it's come from their biodiversity fund is uh, there's a recognition that we're losing some ecosystems that are really important for rare and threatened species. In fact, this photo is taken where you might on a rare occasion see uh, an orange bellied parrot, which is the world's most endangered species. It's estimated that there's only about 50 of these birds left in the wild. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this restoration program. Um, there are four parts to the program. The first is developing restoration action plans to convert an industrial coastal wasteland back into a wetland. This is happening out of um, Avalon Coastal Reserve. Um, for the movie buffs among you, 
this is the site where they filmed Mad Max 1 in 1978, 79. So this is where Mel Gibson's wife gets chased by the toe cutter gang when she's trying to buy an ice cream for her daughter. So fun fact there. I don't think the site's actually changed much. I watched the movie again recently and it pretty much looks the same. Uh, but what we're looking to do at the site is um, we're trialing a method that is being released in the second half of this year by the Clean Energy Regulator, um, where we're looking to punch holes in the dikes and levees that were introduced by European settlers uh, when they arrived in the country. Um, and by doing so, we're, we're looking to bring back natural tidal exchange. And our, our belief is that many of these blue carbon ecosystems, in particular here, it's the salt marsh. The salt marsh will come back on its own. Uh, hopefully the mangroves and seagrass too will follow suit. Uh, so that's the first program. The second program is one uh, that involves low cost fencing. We're working with private landholders, mostly farmers, to exclude cattle that are grazing right at the edge of the shoreline. And that grazing is causing a lot of erosion problems. It's, it's caused die off of the salt marsh there. Um, and just to show you how effective this is, this photo sort of does that. On the left hand side, you have an area of farmland is still actively grazed by cattle. And then we've installed a fence. And then on the right hand side, you see uh, gorgeous salt marsh, beautiful salt marsh that is sequestering carbon um, and also um, providing a lot of other biodiversity benefits. Um, we've actually done some mapping. We were kind of surprised with how effective this was as a low cost form of restoring these ecosystems, just put a fence in about $17 per metre. Um, we've looked to, well, could we scale up along the Victorian coastline? And as it turns out with our preliminary modelling, there's about 30,000 hectares of land where we believe we could restore using this fencing method. Um, and that would draw down about an extra 27,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide or, or those blue balls I showed you, about 27,000 tonnes of carbon each year if we can get that happening at scale. The final program, oh, sorry, no, the, the second final program, program three, it's uh, working with our traditional owners, um, trying to protect what's left of their cultural heritage when it comes to coastal wetlands. So our indigenous communities have long regarded wetlands as vitally important for their livelihoods. They're the supermarkets, the hardware stores, the pharmacies. Uh, as I indicated earlier, European settlers felt very different about these ecosystems. Uh, our colonial ancestors regarded them as unproductive land of little uh, practical use, and uh, they destroyed the equivalent of about 8 million football fields worth of coastal wetlands. Um, so we're working at the moment with uh, the Wadawurrung uh, people uh, to um, uh, work with them on restoring a, a beautiful patch of coast that's been um, degraded uh, with European settlement. So. The final program uh, is uh, we've got a dedicated community engagement program. Um, this is a video that comes from our HSBC uh, program with HSBC Bank. Uh, HSBC had a lot of their staff, we're talking senior executives that are making decisions around the board table with finance, $1 trillion worth of sustainable finance. And they wanted to make sure their employees really understood concepts around uh, climate change and natural capital and ecosystem services. So um, they engaged us to take them out into wetlands with us um, to get them to participate in our research for an immersive experience. And can I just say, we have done some social science on these people. Let's see if I can play that again uh, to see, do these immersive experiences make a difference over just hearing say a charismatic lecture or a cool Attenborough documentary and what we found is a significant difference in not just people's knowledge and awareness of the issues with climate change, but in their behavior. So we would survey them after they've participated in this program, which we're throwing executives normally in suits. We're throwing them in the mud. Uh, we took over 300 executives from 21 industries in the mud. There's actually the CEO of HSBC New Zealand is, is out there just um, in that last slide. Um, we threw them in the mud and we get to see that they're uh, thinking differently when they go back home. They're telling people about these issues. Um, and so I really would say that, you know, these coastal wetlands, these blue carbon ecosystems, I mean, to be honest, they're not the most charismatic of ecosystems. They're muddy, boggy swamps. I mean, we still in the English language, we say we get bogged down with the details. I get swamped with work. Um, they're, they're not really appreciated in the same way, say, our coral reefs are by most Australians. So we've got a bit of a charisma issue, you know, they're regarded as the armpits of the coast. And I think when you take people out into these ecosystems, 
they start to see something very different. They start to see the beauty and they start to learn about just how important they are. Now, uh, finally and briefly, I wanna tell you a few, uh, few more things about some of the co-benefits. I've sort of hinted at them a little bit. You know, most of the talk has been about blue carbon, but um, we wanted to try and put in dollar terms what coastal wetlands do for, um, for humanity, that do for particularly Australians. Um, also when it comes to other important features we learned that they're really important for coastal protection, for tourism and recreation, and commercial and recreational fisheries. So this was a three year program with the Nature Conservancy called Mapping Ocean Wealth. And uh, you know, one of the great tools we have in communicating value is maps. Maps are one of the oldest forms of non-verbal communication. Uh, they go back you know, tens of thousands of years. Uh, you can show pretty much anybody a map, but you've probably all been lost when you've been overseas sometimes and you're pointing to a map and you don't speak the language and people understand what you mean. We decided, could we map the ecosystem service values from coastal wetlands around Port Phillip Bay, Western Port Bay? And in some cases, we were able to scale up around Australia. And I'm just going to give you a few of the highlights, um, starting with recreation. So, you know, the, some of you may be bird watchers. I didn't really realize how much bird watching was happening in the coastal wetlands around Port Phillip Bay. But it turns out there are some very wealthy, uh, look, if I was to stereotype these, these people, they're uh, gray haired, older males. Um, they were spending a lot of money and taking a lot of effort to go into these wetlands to observe birds. In fact, we had a really big spike in the data where we saw a group of bird watchers spent $130,000 traveling from all around the world to see a male tufted duck that had turned up in the Melbourne water uh, sewage treatment plant. It's the first time this bird's ever been seen in Australia. It came from the Northern Hemisphere and ended up in our sewage treatment plant. So we've been mapping the value that uh, bird watching brings to the economy through these wetlands. I mean, many of these birds are only ever seen in these coastal wetlands. Uh, we also looked at coastal protection. Now here's where the numbers get really big. Uh, we put out these pressure sensors, which kind of measure the attenuation of waves and storms in mangrove forests. Uh, we found that they were attenuating waves somewhere in the order of 37 to 71%. Um, and when we started to look around Australia and we did a lot of modeling, uh, here's what we learned. We learned that Australia's blue carbon ecosystems reduce flood erosion hazards by 33%. They're protecting the homes of 120,000 Australians each year and pr protecting $40 billion in assets. By 2100, modeling predicts that socioeconomic damages by coastal hazards will increase 2.5 fold if the, we lose our coastal wetlands. Um, and it, uh, these sort of figures get you really thinking about new and innovative ways in which we can get the finance, uh, the insurance sector in, involved. I mean, what if instead of putting up a concrete wall to protect our shorelines against extreme weather events, we were um, you know, putting up mangrove forests? I can see I'm almost out of time. I'm very conscious of this, Varesh. I'll just finish with a couple of final remarks. Uh, the, the numbers are really cool as well for fish production from, uh, in particular, seagrass ecosystems. We found that about 61% of the diet uh, for our commercially and recreationally important fish is coming from coastal wetlands. Um, and we, we did some studies and found that one hectare of seagrass produces about an extra 50,000 fish each year than a bare nearby area of sediment, bare sand. So they're really important for fish production. They're underpinning a lot of our recreational and important fisheries because they provide a nursery ground for fish. Um, so if you want to know more about our projects, please check out our website, bluecarbonlab.org. Uh, there's quite a lot of content in there. You can sort of jump in and I, I reckon it'll probably take you a few days before you came out if you really got stuck into what we do. Um, this is the energetic group of people that I have the pleasure of working with every single day. It's the Blue Carbon Lab, very passionate um, about what we do. Um, I just want to finish by saying, um, reiterating that nature-based solutions are only receiving 3% of global climate global climate investment, but they could account for about a third of all emission reduction needed to meet uh, our global warming targets. So um, thanks for having me as a speaker. If you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Uh, while Brian's talking, I do need to run upstairs and put three kids to bed. Um, so I will disappear off screen for just a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Can everyone hear me okay? This is Brian Von Hersen with the Climate Foundation. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can. Very, well. Thank you. Very good. And can you see the slide set as well? Yes. Yeah. 
Very good. Thank you. Well, welcome this evening, and uh, I, many thanks to Peter for that wonderful introduction to Blue Carbon. I uh, look forward to sharing with you tonight some of the innovations that we've developed for marine permaculture and how we can use it to help regenerate life in the ocean and to enable a truly regenerative future on land as well as in the sea. So uh, looking forward to uh, sharing that with you. So um, at the Climate Foundation, we focus on food security for a billion people who depend on the ocean for their primary source of uh, protein. Also, it's not only enough food for humanity, but we're seeking to regenerate enough food for nature as well, including the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and ultimately on terrestrial ecosystems as well. And finally, if we can measure the carbon balance and the carbon export of these regenerative interventions, we can begin to account for the power of these nature-based climate solutions to actually address the challenges that are before us. We're very happy to be partnered with Paul Hawken of the Drawdown book, and he's uh, cited not only marine permaculture, but cows on our beach, they eat seaweed and reduce their methane emissions. And uh, we're very happy to be part of those solutions. And we're also very happy to be part of Damon Gamow's work with 2040 that actually uh, list and describe all of the potential that we have if we make the changes in this decade a very hopeful view of what 2040 can be like. And we are very happy that marine permaculture is showcased as one of five potentially regenerative solutions that can transform our, um, the carbon balance of our civilization. So the problem is the year I was born, my father's uh, office started to start measuring carbon dioxide on the side of Mauna Loa. And this was um, the Keeling curve and the Keeling curve um, in, in 1959 uh, was a lot lower than it is today. But uh, of course, it's much higher, dramatically higher than um, the historic uh, last half a million years, 800,000 years in this case. And part of the problem of all those uh, greenhouse gases is that about 93% of the ensuing global warming ends up in the surface layers of the ocean. And that means coral reefs that are too hot, kelp forests that are too hot, and a decimation of those ecosystems. Now the kelp forests, are, of course, are on the Great Southern Reef, all around the southern part of Australia. I would say um, the northern tip is right, right here in southeast Queensland, with the uh, Eclonia kelp forest, the common kelp forest, it goes all the way down to Victoria, all the way west to Perth, and even further north. Although we have lost uh, quite a bit of that in recent years. Um, furthermore, uh, in particular, in western Australia, uh, they lost a thousand square kilometers during the uh, 2011 heat wave. And that um, beautiful uh, Econia kelp forest was replaced by algae turf. Similarly in Tasmania, there are several regions and over the last eight years, we've seen an enormous reduction of, uh, of kelp and the result and, and the problem has been the water's gotten a lot warmer, three degrees warmer off the Eastern Tasmania and the nutrient levels have dropped proportionally. And so uh, even in the 1960s and 1970s, there was enough kelp to commercially harvest. That didn't affect the population, but the warming water and the decreasing nutrient levels had a dramatic effect on the macrocystis kelp cover to where we've lost 95% of that. Um, here's another picture of the kelp forest that was suddenly lost off of um, Western Australia and another picture of the um, thousand square kilometers that we're going. Um, Charlie Varen in 2008 gave the Royal Society lecture in the UK where he articulated the, um, the challenges that it, with every mass extinction, we see a, um, a loss of the coral reefs. And that's the, the tan, the brown colored bars are, represent the coral reef growth that occurs just before the extinctions. The problem is now we're seeing these uh, annual bleachings on the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs, which are acting like the canary in the coal mine. They're really telling us that the um, water is too warm that we get this annual, almost annual uh, thermally induced photo bleaching. And we're in serious danger of reaching and entering the, the mass, the sixth mass extinction on the planet. Um, and there are roughly a million species that are now threatened. So it's a very serious problem that we need to try to address and address in an integrated and um, authentic way. The loss of habitat of kelp forest, for example, means that we're losing a lot of sea creatures. And on the kelp forest and the coral reef, close to 25% of all marine species depend on these ecosystems for some part of their life cycle. So it's very important for the survival of the species in the ocean to retain these habitats. So we look for approaches and solutions that can actually address this. 
The first of which, Peter did a great job of articulating the traditional blue carbon ecosystems that include mangroves, seagrasses, and salt marshes. We've been working for the last uh, half a decade with the Blue Carbon Commission in uh, part of the United Nations on uh, really providing the evidence for kelp forests as emerging blue carbon sinks. They uh, fix a lot of carbon, and then the sinking of that carbon is not local, but it's still profound. And I hope to show you some of the indications of that. One of them is this bar chart, which at the top shows uh, in the middle here, the, the tropical rainforest, the top is open ocean, and this uh, blue bar down near the bottom are algae, al algae beds and reefs. And the interesting thing is that the amount of carbon fixed every year per uh, square meter of al algae bed and reef is actually 15% more than a tropical rainforest. So in many ways, the tropical rainforests of Australia could arguably, in terms of carbon, could be the Great Southern Reef, which is all the Aclonia kelp that manages to fix huge amounts of carbon, some 11% of which ends up in deep trenches and ends up getting uh, down in the sediment air. So this shows some of the uh, beauty of the Aclonia kelp forest and how it can effectively um, be a great habitat for fishes and ultimately can uh, provide a lot of carbon fixation. And uh, when we grow this offshore, we can uh, have food feed and fertilizer and the residual seaweed that we don't use for products we can actually use um, to sink to the middle and deep ocean where it remains for over a thousand years if sunk to a depth of over a thousand meters. So this is the picture of the iconic uh, kelp forest that uh, it's a thriving metropolis of life. I mean, it's habitat for fishes, the algae provides food for fish, and of course, many marine invertebrates. Well, before we ever had global warming, um, natural up fine um, pre-industrially, but now we've got a deeper thermocline, which means the water's warmer and there's a bigger energy barrier to upwelling. And that failure of upwelling is what's caused the lack of nutrients because the nutrients are down deep. Beans, anchovies, small salmonids, and uh, profound results as an, as, a, as an outcome. And in elevation view, uh, a wave energy system can bring this water up to the surface, provide substrate and irrigate the kelp forest and enable it to thrive, which ultimately ends up uh, enabling not only uh, crop circles on land, but potentially kelp forest circles in the sea at a safe distance away from the reef where we can actually enable that to work. When we're done uh, you know, growing the, the kelp and mowing the lawn, we can uh, provide some high value food, feed and fertilizer products. And then uh, after that, we can sink the residual seaweed. And if we sink it down a thousand meters, it will stay underwater for a thousand years, even after it's been eaten and converted into carbon dioxide at depth, that water doesn't get back up to the surface until uh, a thousand years after it's, it's gone in. So that thousand year sequestration time means it's a we had enormous amount of uh, coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. The water's too warm, it causes the corals to be sensitive to light. And when you get the normal amount of sunlight in the summer, we get 67% dead off of, the, uh, off of Cookstown. Um, when we go further offshore in the Torres Straits, it was actually only 26% dead. And what's happening here in the orange zone is that these internal waves are, cra are breaking onto the reef and bringing some cool water onto the reef. And it's cool enough that uh, those corals actually cool and survive, even with occasional exposure to deeper cool water. And then there were also some tropical cyclones down here in the south that actually uh, cooled off the water several degrees Celsius. And the result was only 1% dead. So those were important lessons that we thought we would test out. And starting way back in 2009, we managed to do a test where we took uh, corals that were in American Samoa and we uh, cooled the water by half a degree Celsius. And we were surprised that uh, we thought it would take two or three months before the corals might change color. But in actually less than um, 24 hours, the corals came back to color and they stayed uh, uh, unbleached for over two weeks after we stopped treatment. So even with 24 hours of treatment, we got a dramatic uh, reversal of coral bleaching. And we believe that uh, using this kind of upwelling approach where we grow seaweed sustainably and cool hectares of coral reef that we could in fact build an economically sustainable approach to keeping the environment cool enough for the corals to continue to survive. 
So we're enthusiastic about making that work. And so we're starting right now with hectare scale marine permaculture on phase three. Uh, we have three steps to get up to a hectare. And uh, I'm very happy to say that we've raised enough crowdfunding support to do uh, several hundred square meters. The stepping stone that we're raising for this year is to get to a thousand square meters that will enable us then to go to the commercially viable hectare, which will enable families around Australia to grow hectares of kelp and other local seaweeds and provide high quality food, uh, animal feed to reduce methane and fertilizers that can provide your garden with a much higher growth rate than would otherwise be possible. M way over the NPK fertilizer, this is something that actually upregulates the gene expression of the plants. And uh, then phase four, we can actually look at building bigger systems later. But we're enthusiastic about bringing this technology to, to Australia and scaling it. Now, we've found a dozen value chains for products, including food, feed, and fertilizer to begin with. And one of the key societal benefits that we find is getting the food security for billions of people, the reduced methane production of our livestock. There are 30 million cattle in Australia, and reducing that methane will have a huge effect on reducing the carbon emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions of Australia and meet the Paris Accords. And then finally, with biostimulants, we get increased crop yields, habitat creation for fishes and invertebrates, ultimately even better biofuels. And finally, a blue carbon sink where we can, uh, after we decarbonize most of our carbon emissions of our civilization, sink the rest into the middle and deep ocean. Our Climate Foundation has projects across the world, including Philippines right now, where we're pioneering the uh, growth of red seaweeds with marine permaculture, uh, Tasmania and Australia, where we're working on sustainable uh, kelp uh, seaweed mariculture systems using marine permaculture, and plans for Indonesia across the South Pacific and the Western Pacific. And a lot of our work began in the United States, but we're very happy to call Australia our home at present and see how we can scale seaweed production here in Australia and around the world. So we'd love to have your help in uh, enabling marine permaculture to become real in Australia and re real in our neighboring countries as well. Um, both contributions of time and energy and funding will help us to get to that milestone of building a sustainable uh, family industry, if you will, of um, hectares of, of seaweed that families can grow and enable uh, part of the regenerative future that we're expecting in seas as well as soils. I'm very happy to share with you that I'm uh, working on an article with um, uh, Dave Holmgren, one of the fathers of permaculture. And he told me that uh, his colleague, um, Bill Mollison, had got his original concept for uh, permaculture by studying the kelp forests off of Eastern Tasmania. And for me, that means going full circle, that we're going from the sea and the lessons that the ecosystems of the kelp forest can teach us to the land and understanding the marsupial relationships with the Tasmanian rainforest. And finally, with marine permaculture, back to the sea, where we can take the dozen design principles of permaculture and apply them to marine ecosystems and ensure that humanity is part of the natural equation for how do we work with natural ecosystems to ensure a thriving future with enough food for humanity and ultimately enough food for nature. And with that, I thank you and dedicate this talk to all the little creatures on land and sea that uh, don't get to vote, but uh, are still basically, uh, we, we must steward these, these creatures and these ecosystems and ensure that we leave the planet with as much biodiversity as we came to, we came, came to it with. So with that, I'll thank you very much and uh, happy to open the floor to uh, questions. Fantastic talk, Brian and uh, Peter as well. Thank you very much for that. It's uh, fascinating. And I must admit, uh, I'd love to see that um, recovery of the bleached uh, uh, coral so quickly. That wasn't something I expected at all. And so fantastic to see. Well, it's, it was a real joy to our hearts to see it recover so well. I, we found time and again, if you give nature half a chance, she will rebound with exponential thriving. And we've seen that from the Great Barrier Reef and the corals of American Samoa to the red seaweeds of, um, of the Philippines. And there are plenty of red seaweeds in the northern bits of Australia as well. And uh, just amazing to us how a little bit of nutrient and temperature relief results in just uh, incredible 
uh, bountiful returns for nature as well as for humanity. Great. Okay, uh, look, a couple of people have put in a few questions while we've been talking. Uh, one of the questions uh, was around, um, you know, how susceptible, are, and I suppose partly about, um, um, you know, we're all expecting climate change to cause sea level rise and therefore the um, the boundary of uh, where um, you know, things grow probably to change. So is there a, a issue with the kelps also of moving and needing a specific sort of environment? How will that be sort of, how resilient are they like that? Well, it's pretty scary for the um, Tasmanian Macrocystis kelps, which, uh, you know, they would normally try to go further south to find a, a cooler habitat with enough nutrients. But you fall off the end of Tasmania and there's no more land <laughs> until you get to Antarctica. So aside from a quarry island, uh, there's precious little habitat to actually provide the kind of um, uh, kelp forest substrate that's needed. And that's why we have marine permaculture, which provides the substrate as well as the upwelling that's needed for a kelp forest to thrive. So when we run out of land and at the southern tip of Tasmania, we can be building the substrates on marine permacultures and ensure they have enough irrigation to uh, keep those ecosystems alive during the difficult um, decades to come. Sure. Okay. Look, uh, one of the questions that came in also prior to this, um, just a few minutes prior to this, um, was around uh, just looking at the in picture if we're trying to get sequestration we've got a huge challenge here because of the amount of carbon we have to sequester so there's a level of industrialization that needs to happen with all these solutions that's only going to be driven if there's a any well, cost associated with it or a you know a product line as you were describing does that require a carbon tax and I, I think we could do all right on the first uh, gigaton uh, by simply developing the food, feed, and fertilizer industries. That said, we're fully in favor of the uh, Citizens Climate Lobby efforts to put a predictable and rising price on carbon. Uh, ultimately, it may be important that people pay to pollute. And if once we understand that carbon dioxide and methane is in fact pollution, then uh, we need to really you know, have those externalities brought internal. Um, but you know, I've got to say today, the, the carbon revenues are perhaps one or 10% of the total revenues. We're looking at food, feed and fertilizer products that are worth thousands of dollars per ton. And you know, the, the, the carbon today is maybe 10 or a few tens of dollars per ton. So um, it's a very small tail at the moment, wagging a big dog. <laughs> and so um, and in some sense, um, the first gigatons on us, because if we do a good job of creating carbon negative food products, and I love the uh, seaweed sauerkraut that's in Byron Bay. It's only a few percent seaweed, but we're looking to build, to provide more uh, fresh as well as dried seaweed products that people can enjoy that'll be carbon negative. And so I think voting with one's pocketbooks uh, and, and wallets will be very important where we have radical transparency and disclose the uh, carbon negativity and the, and the climate positivity of, of various products means that people can choose to buy carbon negative dairy or carbon negative seaweed or other carbon negative products. That's gonna be more and more important as we go forward. And that'll be one way that we can really shift consumption and production to sustainable products. And I think that's gonna be increasingly important. We're looking forward to being part of that dramatic change. And then finally, um, you know, I think uh, as we vote with our pocketbooks and ultimately aim for carbon negative products, then um, I believe there'll be a way to not only address this from a uh, production standpoint, but then ultimately with a predictable and rising price on carbon, um, we could actually fix additional gigatons of carbon. And it uses a very small, like less than 1% of the oceans enough to balance gigatons of carbon. And um, there's plenty of empty ocean, according to David Attenborough, there's 100 million square kilometers of accessible ocean between uh, where we are now and my home state of California. And that's in the subtropics and tropical Pacific Ocean alone. So less than 1% of one ocean can potentially feed the planet, uh, humanity, as well as nature, and enable uh, the kind of gigaton scale of carbon sequestration that can be at least one wedge in the blue carbon ecosystems that uh, can fix gigatons of carbon per year and get us back on track. We have to decarbonize, number one, and that means a 50 to 80% reduction in carbon emissions from our uh, civilization. Once we've decarbonized 80%, 
blue carbon, natural, nature-based climate solutions can do the rest and bring our civilization carbon negative. And we're very optimistic about the future. It's really about building the political will to make it happen sooner rather than later. Um, Peter, is carbon sort of pricing required for your um, research work as well, or will that just be a piggyback? Oh, I love the idea of a carbon tax. Uh, I mean, you know, we had a carbon tax in Australia, remember, introduced by the Gillard government, and some people said it was a failure, but emissions dropped by the largest amount in 26 years when we had the carbon tax. And I think economic theory has shown that when you tax the heck out of something, especially activities that have a negative impact on other people in society, we did it with tobacco tax. I mean, I was standing at the servo the other day waiting to pay for my petrol and the guy in front of me bought a packet of cigarettes. It was 50 bucks for a packet of cigarettes. You know, I mean, I don't know how people are, are affording it. And, you know, I think what Brian touched on around people making choices um, that are, are good for the planet, you know, that's probably the people who are on this call. What do you do about all those other people who don't care? Or, and I think that's where the carbon tax gets us. Um, but also too, I mean, I find sometimes the whole climate change issue exhausting. I was meant to have solar panels installed on my roof today. Uh, There's a problem, right? But I feel guilty when, you know, we, we turn on the air con or that sort of things. But we have complicated, busy lives. Most of us do. And I don't think we want to have that guilt. And I think a carbon tax just takes the thinking out of it for us. You know, it's built into, you know, you, you're paying for the privilege to pollute um, by taxing any activity that adds, you know, CO2 to the atmosphere. So I'm all for a carbon tax. And I think it would just make a huge difference with, you know, shifting behaviours in the right direction. Um, okay, a question from Kate. Um, I think uh, responding, uh, um, Brian, to your comment about how the uh, kelp forests are sort of going further south and we're running out of land, is there capability of regenerating them and does that require intervention in some way or artificial sort of rafts or whatever? Well, we are, we are uh, intervening with our marine permacultures. The idea is to take the substrate offshore, do some upwelling and irrigation, and seed those kelp forests onto those platforms and enable a sustainable cultivation. At the same time, we're uh, providing some ecosystem life support offshore. And it's been suggested, actually, that in the wintertime, we bring the kelps in in the late autumn to the estuaries and the bays and the inlets near Tasmania, because that's when the, the kelp forest actually spores are released from the, the kelp and it will feed uh, naturally the bays and the inlets uh, in Tasmania once again. So uh, we're enthusiastic about enabling that to occur because it could help the restoration of kelps ultimately. But to do that, you know, it's going to take some years because the water remains too warm in places where it's not irrigated. So unless we can, um, you know, ultimately we may even have some irrigation projects closer to shore. So we are hopeful that we can keep the kelp forests alive if, if we can scale marine permaculture. And ultimately, that'll be the um, commercially sustainable hectare, uh, family-sized farm. And then longer term, we can go to larger scale. But every hectare should be fixing oh, on the order of 50 uh, tons of kelp and 50 tons of uh, carbon dioxide uh, every year. And uh, it could be multiples of that if we get the formula right and nature rebounds more than we expect her to. Um, there's been a question, a couple of people are sort of looking at sort of the economics of your organizations and where they come from. Um, and I presume if you could just include, uh, to cross over to another question about federal funding, what sort of federal funding are you getting there? So yes. You talked well, about I'm calling you right now from the, the side of the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Center, the Blue Economy CRC, which is a very interesting private partner, um, public partnership. Um, the Blue Economy CRC is a $310 million program that's funded a third by industry, a third by the Commonwealth government, and a third by uh, the academic uh, universities and institutions around Australia. So uh, it's a great partnership because it's really helping to lead out and bring, you know, seeming competitors together. Uh, you know, we've got seaweed competitors and fin fish competitors, and they all get together in one room and say, look, here's our industry problems. Here's what we need to solve. And the best minds in the universities are set to trying to work on these industry problems and actually get some very sustainable solutions. 
So we're in the middle of this workshop right now. We have one more day tomorrow. And not only the uh, Blue Economy CRC, but also the Marine Bioproducts CRC, which is hopefully going to get approval in the next few weeks. And if we get a thumbs up on the MB CRC, then we're looking at uh, a multi-million dollar program. Again, I believe that one will be worth a total of around $280 million. And this is something that's helping the economy of Australia at the same time we're working to be able to regenerate these ecosystems. So I'm very impressed and very pleased uh, to be part of this Australian public-private partnership that enables that to work. Historically, we've relied upon uh, philanthropic foundations to, uh, for support at the Climate Foundation. We are working towards reward crowdfunding, and at some point uh, we're hoping to offer what we call a kelp coin, which um, is a uh, forward contract on a ton of living kelp forest on a marine permaculture. Um, and ultimately that would represent a regenerative ton of living uh, habitat that can grow fish, it can grow more seaweed. And then when fi finally, when those kelp coins are retired, uh, we actually sink a ton of seaweed into the middle and deep ocean, which represents a ton of carbon dioxide sequestration. So that's kind of a, a different approach. And then uh, further down the ride or road, we may be looking at um, some other kind of crowdfunding solutions as well. So uh, we're looking forward to more public participation and in fact, Australia has a wonderful uh, equity crowdfunding model that enables uh, small companies to raise several million dollars each year to actually bring these solutions to bear. And we're looking forward to the possibility of doing that here in Australia. Now that we're here under the Distinguished Talent Visa, we're looking forward to helping Australian economy as well as the ecosystems. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, helping the Australian environment and the Australian economy. Uh, very happy to be calling Australia our home. And Peter, your funding is federal government and private as well? It comes from a bit of everywhere. I mean, we have individuals occasionally donate. That's probably the stuff I appreciate the most. Um, where I like getting money the most is from big corporates that have deep pockets and I think should be uh, digging deep uh, to support. So we, in that regard, we've had funding from some banks, airlines, um, some oil and gas companies. You know, these are people, I guess, too, who are quite influential. So we like working with them because we can see that the um, magnitude of change that they could have if they do get behind these causes within their organization is just really huge. Um, we also get a bit of money from the Australian Research Council. Um, at the moment, we're um, also leading quite a big bid similar to Brian. It's a, for an Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Blue Carbon Climate Solutions. Um, and soon we're gonna go on a partnership drive trying to, to, uh, to basically you know, get people to, to chip in wherever they can. Uh, the request from the Australian government is uh, $35 million of taxpayer dollars. And I guess the reason why we feel that's necessary is because there's so much appetite for blue carbon. So many people wanna buy blue carbon offsets, um, but everybody sitting on the sidelines, pumping up their tires, waiting until the hard work's done, all that R&D's done before they're gonna buy. They all want the ribbon cutting ceremony. They want the minister out there launching you know, the big thing, but no one wants to pay for that R&D. And I think that's because it is, com it's common good research. It's everybody, all of Australia benefits when we get behind biosequestration. I mean, we've changed a lot of light globes. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, hopefully weaning off coal and you know putting solar panels up and using wind farms but you know we still got this issue of you know we've got to draw down carbon if we're going to reset the planet's thermostat so uh, sorry that's probably a long-winded way of saying we get money from all sorts of different sources but um, if you want to have an insight into the life of a scientist I spend a significant amount of my time not actually doing science but trying to find money to do science um, it is really hard to find money for environmental research because, you know, you're trying to create a really good value proposition. And look, I'm in awe of what Brian has done here. Brian is, is a master at creating value proposition here. Um, you know, it's always a challenge to try and rally money for something, um, you know, cute and furry. It, it, you think that's challenging? Well, you should try a, an ugly swamp, right? <laughs> this, is, this is challenging stuff. So um, we're constantly trying to think of ways that we could try and draw money from people. Um, and, uh, you know, carbon, carbon markets are probably one of our big hopes at the moment. And uh, I'd say seconding uh, what Peter said, uh, it is a very time consuming on the fundraising side, but I'm very happy to announce that, um, you know, we, we have had a uh, corporate foundation uh, put up $100,000 saying we'll do a dollar for dollar match so that every contribution that's coming in this year will be matched dollar for dollar for the next $200,000 of fundraise. And so that part is encouraging because it means everything that small that individuals put in the small grants 
are going to actually be doubled uh, this year. And so um, we're about to put that up on our website. Uh, it's that, happening right now. And um, I just want to um, say that there are mechanisms like that that can really get the corporate involvement uh, increased. And I think we're hopeful to uh, ensure that you know, they're participating in this uh, important regenerative process. And maybe I could just add one small thing there. Um, you know, one of the things we love putting our donations towards are the next generations of passionate scientists. And these people are almost below the poverty threshold. I mean, my PhD students earn $28,000 a year total. Some of these people have kids, right? They're surviving. They're paying their rent. They're paying their phone bills. They're everything, their food, everything they've got to live off is $28,000 a year. That's not a lot of money. These people are not in it for the money. Um, so, you know, if you want to, if you want to back, you know, there's some amazing people out there, um, young and upcoming researchers. Um, if you can, if you want to donate and put towards a scholarship for a, an up and coming PhD student, I think it's a great cause. Um, let me just ask a question to both of you here. Um, do they feel blue carbon solutions are sufficiently well represented in go uh, the global reports like the IPCC? And do these initiatives reduce ocean acidity in the local area in the vicinity of the kelp forest? It's like two different questions there. <laughs> well, along those lines, we have colleagues from the University of Chicago who have measured the ocean acidification decrease in the kelp forest and immediately downstream from the kelp forest. And the numbers were really profound. Normally, we're looking for pH changes in the ocean that, you know, of like uh, from pH of seven to pH of 7.05. That's considered a big pH change. But amazingly, they measured in the kelp forest changing a pH from like 7.7 uh, .7 to 8.2. So we're talking about half of a pH change right in the forest and downstream from the forest, the same thing. So if you're growing a shellfish or an invertebrate or any kind of small juvenile invertebrate like that, uh, it's a profound increase in their ability to form their skeletons and their shells and actually do fine. So it does a great job of reducing ocean acidification that said, on the Great Barrier Reef, today's problem is thermally induced photobleaching, which is not ocean acidification. For the next decade or three, it's going to be the water temperatures that are going to be really challenging the reef much more. Uh, in the higher latitudes like Tasmania, ocean acidification could be more of an issue. That's where the kelp forest can be transformative. And literally, I think we can stave off the Permian mass extinction, one marine permaculture kelp forest at a time, if we can uh, build the will to actually scale this on a commercial scale and enable family-sized and, and larger-sized marine permacultures in the future. Uh, and Varesh, I get quite mesmerized when I'm listening to Brian. I actually forgot what the first part of the question was. If you, what That's was the presentation in the uh, global reports like the IPCC. Oh, yeah. You know, no. wetlands were not in there for a long time. I mean, they've got the very famous report we refer to all the time is called the wetland supplement because they forgot about wetlands, right? Um, they were just off the radar for a long time. Um, so it's really good to see that they are becoming a big feature. And, you know, it's it's funny because we just discover, um, we're making huge discoveries constantly. I had the, the pleasure of um, getting to represent the Australian government at an IPCC meeting and, I, you know, sitting in the room and trying to see how these decisions happen. And I remember that they did a vote for what about farm dams? Like, does anybody know anything about farm dams? Okay, we're going to come back after the break and we're going to have a bunch of people researching how many papers are out there about emissions from farm dams. And they came back, they did a vote and I saw the head of the Australian government uh, greenhouse gas accounts, you know, he's, they said, yes, we need to incorporate farm dams. Uh, that was it, there was a vote. It, they're not included, they need to be included. And I could see this poor fellow shaking his head. I was like, what's, what's the deal? You know, why, why is that such a problem? And he said, well, Australia's got a lot of farm dams, right? We don't know how much. There's probably millions of them. And our Landsat, you know, these satellites that are basically flying over and measuring everything, they don't pick up a lot of farm dams because of the, the grid size that they're in. So, you know, that spawned some fascinating research for us. Like, I mean, we, we love a good problem because we're trying to find solutions here. So, you know, we had a bunch of PhD students go out and measure emissions from farm dams. And you go, okay, so bad news, guys. You know, there's a little over 2 million farm dams. We just released a database a couple of months ago showing where all they are around Australia. Um, and, you know, they're one of the single largest source of emissions per water body, any water body in Australia. So huge emissions, you know, are coming out of these things. And it's like, okay, here's a problem. But then, you know, here's an opportunity maybe to turn um, lemons into lemonade. And that we're thinking, we found a really interesting relationship that um, the amount of emissions were related to the amount of nitrate, you know, like basically nutrients that are running into these systems. So we thought, well, what if you reduce the amount of nitrate 
plants do that, if they suck up nitrate, could you then reduce the emissions? So, you know, floating wetlands, for example, maybe they'll also improve evaporation, provide uh, improvements to biodiversity, nesting grounds for birds and frogs and stuff, and, you know, uh, improve water quality and reduce emissions, allow farmers to collect carbon credits for reducing emissions. So, you know, these opportunities present themselves. And then, you know, as scientists, it's quite fun to go and find, you know, a solution to these new problems. <laughs> Um, and look, we are going a little bit over, but um, a few questions still coming in. So let me just get one from one of the doctors who's listening in. Um, have you tried, have either of you really used the sort of health message around um, trying to get further action in, on blue carbon and climate uh, action as well? So I, I heard health message, and I think um, there are two aspects. One is health of the... Um, of the seas and health of the soils, which is very important for the ecosystems. But I also want to touch on the uh, superfood health status of seaweed and other foods uh, for human health. And we're continually amazed at how healthy it is to eat small amounts of seaweed each day. Uh, we see reports from Thailand and from Japan with seven times less breast cancer and significantly less prostate cancer. And they've really attributed this to, uh, to minor seaweed, product, uh, seaweed consumption each day. Uh, it turns out there's antioxidants, phytonutrients, and omega-3 fatty acids that have a transformative effect on health. Um, not only cancer, but also heart disease, uh, cognitive decline, and um, uh, metabolic syndrome. So in the States, we have a terrible problem of obesity. And it turns out little bits of seaweed each day that has a pretty transformative effect on people's metabolisms to the point where uh, they actually uh, lose quite a bit of weight. So we're seeing it as uh, pretty transformative. These results are peer reviewed studies from Europe uh, as well as Asia and uh, the Americas. And so we're looking forward to uh, enjoying a lot more seaweed in our diets in the near future and encourage people to uh, seek out new seaweed foods to try out. Well, from a mental health point of view, I think many of us, especially those of you who lived in Melbourne during a horrendous lockdown of last year, what did you do? Any chance you got to get out of the house, you went down to the local park. You know, you know, nature's often this backdrop to our busy lives. And I think that we learned to appreciate nature in new ways when we uh, had COVID. I mean, I had, I, I back onto a park here. We, first thing we do when we bought the house is we cut a big hole in the fence and we just go out of the park. And there was, I just never seen so many people in the park. Like this is people every weekend there, you know, enjoying it. And so, you know, I, I think that sort of connection with nature uh, is something that needs to happen more and more. Um, so this sort of appreciation, um, you know, encourage people just to, to love it, to embrace it. I mean, for me, it just seems natural because I grew up with that. You know, my parents were always were camping or in nature and stuff. But I think it's just, you know, connecting Aussies with, with their own backyard and appreciating them in new ways. And I think that does a lot for mental health and perhaps also workplaces encouraging that sort of thing as well. I have to second that. I think uh, we were stuck in Singapore for six months and we rode, I rode the bicycle about 4,000 kilometers. And here in Australia, we've done about 2,000 kilometers just enjoying nature. It was our a release, you being able to ride around in nature. Um, okay, look, we're quite a few minutes over. And uh, so look, I think we probably do need to um, start wrapping up. Uh, Vicky, would you like to do the honours, please? I would be very honoured. Thank you, Varesh. Uh, firstly, thank you to our wonderful speakers, Professor McCready and Dr. Brian von Herzen for an excellent presentation. We love your great work and enthusiasm to help our planet. Thank you to BCAG, Marine Care, Ricketts Point, Brasca and SFA for jointly co-hosting co tonight's talk and uh, for all of you for enjoying us. We've had a great turnout of over 100 participants. Uh, sorry we didn't get the opportunity to address all your questions. There were some really good ones there about what more can we do to help restore some of our mangroves and sea kelps. So perhaps you could write to uh, the groups and, and they might be able to address your questions. We've learned so much from your talks that restoring the coastal vegetation and blue ecosystems for carbon sequestration can help mitigate climate change. It was interesting that more than half of our oxygen actually comes from marine plant life, not just trees. It is a devastating thought that we are losing blue ecosystems by one to 2% per year and coral reefs due to warming water and nutrient changes. 
So our efforts should not just be about addressing the health of the land and reduce air pollution to help mitigate climate change for a sustainable future, but also the coast, wetlands, oceans need protection too. It is positive that nature can bounce back so quickly by protecting our coastal wetlands and also restoring kelp forests and building marine permacultures, thanks to the speaker's great work that you're doing and to help restore the blue carbon ecosystems and ocean spaces to help address the declining fish populations, restore habitat for marine life, which ultimately will help the health of the humans with a good supply of marine life and seaweed and food sources and mitigate climate change. So thank you very much. I um, will close up, but I have been asked for a call of action and there are two calls of actions that we would love all of you to assist us. Please help us to block the state government's clean air tax proposed through electric vehicles, write to our local crossbench upper house member Clifford Hayes here in Victoria to vote against the bill. You can get help on writing a letter via the BCAG website. Uh, also, right now, the planning minister, Richard Wynne, is deciding on the future of Western Port Bay. Having received the report on the environmental impact of AGL's gas import terminal, he now has until the end of March to approve or reject this polluting project. He's heard from the experts how disastrous AGL's proposal is for our bay and the climate. He's heard from local councils, community groups and businesses, as well as the state opposition and federal MP Greg Hunt, who have all spoken out in opposition to the project. Now it's our last chance to get a word in. So from, from us to all of you, please write to the Minister Wynne, to Minister Wynne, calling on him to reject AGL's gas import terminal. And you can get a letter to help from the Environment Victoria webpage or from BCAG as well. Uh, Varish has shown us a slide here uh, for you to, um, to uh, find as a guide how we can to get onto this straight away, please. So once again, thank you to our excellent speakers. Thank you to our co-hosts and to all of you for joining us for a fun evening this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you.